Last January, we started actually sharing some of the highlights from our favorite tidbits from the Innovators Mindset podcast. Some of the great stories, some of the great anecdotes, some of the practical suggestions that our wonderful guests had to share. And it was so popular that we wanted to do it every other month. And so again, when you're watching this video, you're gonna see some of the highlights from this month if you didn't get to see some of these full podcasts. And that's a great way to kind of collect these ideas, share some of these things. And it reminds me of why I love connecting through these spaces so much. And even though you're gonna hear some of the great ideas from our guests, we'd love to hear from you as well. And so if you're watching this on YouTube or you're listening you know, on SoundCloud, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, love you to pop over onto YouTube and share your thoughts to this question. What advice would you give to yourself in your first year of teaching? This is one of the questions I've been asking guests, you know, throughout the month and learning from them and kind of hearing some of the things that we've done wrong and how we actually make them better. So we'd love to hear your comments if you can just kind of put them in the comments below. And I also want to take some of these comments and highlight them in future episodes because this podcast is growing. There's a lot of people sharing this, connecting, you know, reaching out to me. And we want to have that opportunity to highlight some of the great community that we have in this space. So I hope that you love some of these stories that are being shared today as much as I love them, but we'd love to hear from you as well. I hope you enjoy the best of February from the Innovators Mindset Podcast. The teacher who inspired me the most was my third grade teacher, Miss Sharon Melvin, who has since passed on. But when I walked into her classroom, it was so different than any other experience I've ever had. She created a family with us in that in that room. She met us where we are as students. And she, even in the, it was the 90s, early, late 80s, and she was literally getting rid of the box well before mm -hmm. anybody had started to coin that term. Um, when it came to teaching our multiplication tables, we were hands on the ground just trying to figure out like our nines times tables and our eights times tables. And she just, every single co content area, math, science, social studies, it came alive. And I did not know this then, but when I eventually ended up going to, um, and graduating from high school and becoming a North Carolina teaching fellow, I had the amazing opportunity to visit her classroom and to talk with her husband who just said the hours and the, the conversations and the materials that she created and put together. It was evident when I was a child that she not this was not a job for her, that she loved what she did. and. Again, I remember the lessons and I remember what I what I gleaned from her, but more importantly, I remember that I belonged in her classroom. And I remember that she talked to us not just about academics, but she talked to us about being good human beings. And this was well before SEL and socio-emotional learning came about. She was doing these things and instilling in us about the power of kindness, about the power of integrity, about how we should put our stake in the ground and be immovable when it came to being citizens when we left her classroom went on to fourth grade but also after we graduated um perhaps the most beautiful homage that i can pay to miss melvin and what she imparted to me not only inspiring me to become a teacher i knew after i knew before but she anchored that feeling for me that i wanted to be an educator it is my senior year in college i was graduating i came home for spring break i got a call from the superintendent and he said can you come by my office i want to talk to you about a job and i said okay absolutely i was like do i have time to change he was like no i need you to come in the office now i want to talk to you he gives me a list and then the list were all the schools in my in our my district that had vacancies and the one of the uh, classrooms was southwest elementary school which was the school i had gone to mm. third grade miss sharon melvin and beside her name it said retirement and he said which classroom would you like and i pointed to her name and i said i want that one and he's like it's yours so i got to visit her um, the day before she retired she had been teaching for 36 years and when i walked in she was like i heard this is going to be your classroom and she says, and I can't think of anything better to start your career than to leave you all of my materials, all of my books, all of my um, different certification and professional development manuals. 
And when she passed the baton to me and I was able to stand where she stood and teach and know that I was teaching students who had sat in desks that I had sat in and get, you know, manipulatives and literacy activities from books that had Melvin written on the binder. It was almost as if she was she was there and I wanted to continue to create that for students well beyond not just as a teacher, but eventually as an administrator, because when you create family, when you create culture for your students, they they don't forget that. They may forget their nines times tables every once in a while, mm-hmm. but they're never going to forget how you made them feel. And so um, I just am so grateful to her for everything she was, everything she did, and to be able to continue to push her legacy. One of the things I think is the most important thing for a, a, a leader, doesn't matter if it's education, political, uh, whatever it might be, corporate, Mm -hmm. the number one thing for leaders to do is to maintain a high level of integrity. To maintain, and now here's my definition of integrity, okay? Because I truly believe everyone in the world has integrity. Everyone. It's just a matter if it's high integrity or if it's low integrity. Everybody has, you know, where do you fit on the continuum? Now, my definition of integrity is a set of beliefs, values, and actions that other people can depend on. It's not mm-hmm. about what you can depend on. It's what other people can depend on. That's what integrity is. Beliefs, values, and then you take those beliefs and values and put them into action. That's what I've loved. Like, that the part of my se- it's part of my season this year. I'm mm-hmm. going to be looking at a book called Cogn- Cognitive Neuroscience, and it's all about neuroscience. I don't know a lot about neuroscience. Mm-hmm. I'm just like learning as I go. And I want to break down the different parts of this book because I want to really, really understand for myself. Again, it's me understanding it, but then helping other people understand what's going on in our brain naturally wants to catastrophize everything. Like it, like it, mm-hmm. it, it goes there. Like our part of our brain that tries to like see it and then jump to a conclusion. That that's a part of it. And from what I've seen so far, like in the research and that our brain doing that, it's not bad for us to do that. But then we have to think: is that the truth? Our brain thinks mm-hmm. that, and then critical critical thinking about what we're thinking. Like it is very meta metacog- metacognition, but it's it, we need to do it. We need to question: Is that the truth of what we think is the truth? Mm-hmm. You know, like that's actually really important. Is we can jump to the conclusion because our brain might naturally do that, but then we have to think: Is that actually is that conclusion right? Is that conclusion correct? And what we're actually jumping to, and then if it's not, or what could be going on instead? Kind of interesting. Um, to think about how many students maybe walk out of schools and don't have that knowledge. And so like, wh- like, I, like what, what actually got you interested in, in some of that stuff? And, you know, like I said, you, you share it, like you, you share, I, I actually saw like, some of the ups and downs you were sharing too with investing and so, like, what, what got you interested in that in the first place? Oh man, I have to say what really turned me on to it. And it, these two events happened approximately the same time. I'm going to date myself like for real, for real. Um, there was an episode of Say by the Bell that came out where <laughs> Zach Morris like bought some stuff yeah, on margin. I'm going to stop you. I, that, okay. is, that is not what I expected. <laughs> How did you get in financial literacy? Well, there's this episode of Saved by the Bell. <laughs> oh, well, of course. Isn't that how everybody gets into it? <laughs> you learn about potatoes sorry, and no. I I'm like what say by the bell okay sorry yes no awesome. no <laughs> yeah so that that's when I like first really started thinking about it and around the same time I was in maybe no a few years later in eighth grade then I remember that we um in civics class had like a unit on investing and so I started you know started thinking about it I didn't really do a whole lot with it um and it's, it's really wild because now that we're talking about blogs, I went back to my very first blog in like 2003, where I was like, you know, thinking I was going to be Beyonce, but not. <laughs> um, and I did like a music blog mm-hmm. and on it, I was just like, oh, I want to get into stocks. And this was like 2003. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, I, I just saw this like about two weeks ago. It blew my mind. Is knowing how to communicate to get the best result. And sometimes I would speak, you know, my way, and then the last thing, thing I would say is, you know, my way is not always the best way. Mm-hmm. Um, and being able to, at 27, hear diversity of thought and work to uh, hear everyone's input and buy-in and then work to a greater resolution and resolve that was something great for kids. And knowing that everybody is a champion and, uh, and in that championship piece, 
giving people the equal opportunity to be a part of it. But that was really one of the hardest things is that I couldn't sell it to you. I couldn't show you the value of it. I couldn't show you the benefit of it. I couldn't support you as you tried it, let you fail and let you see that that was okay. And then pick you back up and keep on moving the way that I could in my assistant principal role. And I really, I really think that being able to model that mm. this wasn't something that was just something superfluous and fun on top of of, of great teaching. You no, know, I had high expectations for academics too. And, and you and right. I talked a lot about this. Um, never were my expectations for academics lowered based on my um, showing you of a blog or a Twitter right. or of connections or of collaboration. This was in addition to high academic e expectations, which again were, were tantamount to my success at Wood Elementary was because that was my floor and never, ever my ceiling. Right. You said this, you know, you said this, um, I read this from you is that you talked about this notion of like the conventional happiness formula is, is wrong. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by that? So there's this formula for happiness that we've all grown up with and been led to believe is the true path. And that path is, um, you know, to go to college and get a degree mm -hmm. and hopefully you choose a job where you make a lot of money. Um, and then you get that job and you climb the corporate ladder or you work harder and you put more hours in. So you get the recognition so you can get a promotion or you can buy the 5,000 square foot home or you can have the brand new, you know, SUV. And so you work hard, you put your head to the grindstone, you work your way up the ladder, you hopefully you create more wealth and it, with more wealth, you get more things in your life. And then at the other end of that formula, you finally have arrived at success, right? You've gotten married, you've had the 2.5 kids, you've got the dog, you've got the nice home, you've got the nice car. And so that's the formula that we've all been fed. What we know from the last 10 to 15 years of research straight out of Harvard University, Sean Aker's work, as well as um, the University of Pennsylvania with Martin Seligman, is that that formula is actually completely backwards. We actually know that when you put your well-being at the forefront, you change every single business, education, and organizational outcome. And here's why, here's why, George. When you're talking about your, you know, you're talking about a brain, right? So we know that a positive brain is 31% more productive than a brain at negative, neutral, or stressed. And this comes straight from Sean Aker. So when we're thinking about, you know, you're wanting your people to be open-minded and ready to come up with creative solutions to their problems and expand their awareness of how they can use technology. But if the people within the building, if their brains are mostly at negative, neutral, or stressed, they're losing productivity. The moment I went up to that vision board and I had to take something off of my vision board because it had already manifested in my life, folks, <laughs> Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Let me tell you, folks, it's so powerful. So you need a vision board. The second thing you need to do, you need to get up and George and I've been talking about this offline. You need to get up every morning and you need to journal. When I got past the daily prompt, I started getting into uh, some deeper things. I started journaling about things that were going on in my professional life, things that were going on in my personal life. This really became my online diary. But here's the other thing that I did, and I journal, and I do that every single day. The other thing that I do, and again, I'm not going to reveal all of them, uh, but I'm definitely going to drop some pro tips here. One of the other things that I do every single morning, folks, some of you may laugh, but I'm going to say to you this, it's been working over and over and over in my life. I have a list of affirmations. And I read those affirmations aloud to myself every morning, every single morning. You may say, well, Vernon, what does that mean? I have an affirmation that says, I am a person that does da 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 And I specifically talk about whatever the action is, who the action benefits, and how it benefits that person. 